and I'll share my desktop. So first we'll start with Qubit. So this is the qubit window. Uh, Trellis looks uh, essentially identical. Over here on the left-hand side, we have um, a view that shows our different sort of elements within the model. Uh, we have our main viewing window in the middle, and then uh, some icons on the right that are sort of quick access um, to various things. There we go, now we're filling the screen. So uh, for Pyleth, we prefer to use the, the Qubit journal. And I may, I'll be saying Qubit, I think, because that's what I'm using, but you can just essentially replace the word Qubit with Trellis. Um, we have found some subtle differences between the two, um, but we've done our best in, our, in the examples to keep and test things on both uh, pieces of software and um, some of the underlying libraries sometimes have slightly different versions, and so we've tried to set up all of our examples so that they work with either one and multiple versions of either one. So we put our, generally we put our mesh in two separate files. We'll usually have a geometry file that does the geometry um, journal file and then another journal file for uh, the meshing. So up here, these little icons that show the little scrolls, those are the journals, uh, access to the journal editor. So I click on the far left one to open up the journal. I'd already loaded the geometry file. And so everything with a pound sign in front of it is a comment. So the first thing I do is I reset uh, qubit. Then I want to create a brick, a brick that is 6,000. Uh, meters in the x direction, 6,000 in the y direction, 4,000 in the z direction. And I'm going to translate it so that the top is at z equals 0. And originally, the center of that brick is at the origin. So I'm going to move it down to uh, 1,000 meters. So let me run these. I'll highlight them. And then I use a three-button mouse. And so I right-click and hit Play Selected. Up here on the top, I wanna, I'm going to select to view it in a semi-transparent. That allows me um, to rotate when I hold down the left mouse button. Go back to the journal. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take this brick. I'm going to slice it vertically to put in a fault surface that runs through the whole thing. So I'm going to create a planar surface um, in the x plane with an offset of 0. And then I'm going to name this surface the fault surface. So there, I have just created a, a surface. It is not chopped through my block. So you can see my block is still one. Um, and then I select the fault plane um, there. Then I also want to create two materials, a viscoelastic material. And so I'm going to create a fault uh, material interface in the Z plane with an offset of minus two kilometers. So it'll be at a depth of two kilometers. Name that surface. So there I've created another surface. I still, my block is still one volume. And if I come over here um, on volumes in the tree view, you can see I have just one volume. It has six surfaces. So a volume is made up of six surfaces. That's looks good. Um, then I now I'm going to chop up that block using what are called web cuts. So I'm going to chop up the block using my fault surface. So boom, now if I let's need to redraw, so let's redraw it. Now you'll notice that my I have a blue side and a green side to my block with the faults in the middle. So I have two volumes, volume one and volume four. Um, Qubit names it however it wants to. Then I'm going to chop volume one with my material interface. So now I'm the, I have a green and purple on the right side. Come back and I'll do a web cut of the other volume with the material surface. That chops my blue volume into a blue and gray volume. So now I have volumes one, four, five, and six. 
And I'm going to name the volumes for convenience. And um, now the way that Qubit does it is when it chops up those volumes at the interface between two volumes, there are actually two surfaces instead of one surface. Um, and additionally, if you have, you can chop up one volume if the adjoining volume was not chopped up. Uh, those surfaces aren't aligned. And so what you, the first thing you want to do is once you've created your geometry is to imprint all with volume all. So that means everything will line up in terms of if one side is divided up, then the other surface uh, on the adjoining volume would also be divided up. And then I'm going to merge all of those duplicate surfaces at the intersection between two volumes. So that's what I'll do. And then if you come down here and you look at sheet bodies, my fault surfaces um, were the sheet bodies. I don't need those anymore. And so I'm going to delete those extra um, surfaces. So now all I have are volumes 1, 4, 5, and 8. So that's I've generated my geometry. I've not yet generated my mesh. So I'm going to open up my mesh generation file. In this case, it's another journal file. So I open that up. The first thing it does is it's going to play back the geometry. And so this allows one journal file to call another. And uh, so if I decide to change my meshing or use, I want to do both hex and tet mesh with the same geometry, that's another reason why I want to create um, a separate mesh file and they can use the same common geometry file. Um, I'll just play back that file and you'll see that it just goes through the exact steps that I did. And so there's my volume. So now I'm going to set the discretization size at 1,000, so one kilometer. Um, you don't see any evidence of that. Um, whoops. I don't want to exit. And I want to mesh volume all. If I want to see the discretization size, I come over over here. So this little, the purple cube with the little cells, that's my mesh icon. You'll see the mode is in mesh. Here's my volume. So vo I have volume, surfaces, curves, and nodes. Volume, I want to see what my discretization size looks like. So I click on the little dimensioning guy. Say all volumes. Um, I want to preview. And I think if I hit apply, you'll see a bunch of little blue dots on the screen. Um, and this, I believe, is the automatic discretization size that it. Um, because I said auto. Um, so I want to go back and I want to redo what the discretization size is. So generally the easiest way that I do that is just play it off the beginning. You can sort of do a reset of the discretization size. So now you see that um, this is in shown in red is the discretization size that I have specified. That's a kilometer. So I had four kilometers uh, along the depth, and you can see I have four uh, vertices, or five vertices. Um, now, it, I, by default, it's going to do a hex mesh, so I didn't say which type of mesh I wanted. So let's just say mesh it all. And let's see, to turn on. So that's another, up here in the top, in the icons, I can turn off whether it's going to show my mesh or not by clicking on the little cube with the mesh. I can turn off the geometry with the, the little geometry icon. And I can select whether I want a wireframe view, hidden wireframe view, um, and so on. So I generally prefer the semi-transparent uh, 3D view. Um, I'll put the mesh on and I'll refresh the display to get rid of those nodes. Now I want to specify my boundary conditions. So here um, I'm going to, for my materials, I have a one material in the upper two blocks and then my viscoelastic material in the lower two blocks. Those are volumes one and four. So I can go over here and because I've named them, it's very easy to identify that those are volumes one and four. 
for my elastic block. So I can create my blocks um, using those volume names, and I'll name that block elastic. Um, and then I'll do the lower block. Those are five and six. I go up in my tree view and look at my blocks. You can see I have an elastic block and a viscoelastic block. Their name, their IDs are one and two. And in Pyleth, we'll tell it that those are IDs are one and two. So those are important. For creating node sets, these are creating the for my boundary conditions within Pyleth, I'm going to have them for my nodes, my faults, um, as well as the lateral boundaries. So I'm going to I first create groups um, that allow me to do some manipulation of those um, selection of vertices, and then I create node sets from those groups. So how do I know what my fault surface is? Well, the easiest way is to select the surface. So notice up here in the selection scheme I have, right now volumes are toggled. I want, if I want to do either surfaces or volumes, I'll have both the surfaces and volumes toggled, but I want just surfaces. So I'll untoggle the volume. And then if I click, you'll notice, oops, I got the top surface. If I, once the top surface is clicked, to see a, ta a surface underneath, I hit tab. And so now it's shown, you can see that it's selected uh, the top of the fault surface. Over here on the left hand side, it shows what surface I've selected. So this is fault surface. To get the lower half, I again hit click. Um, it shows the front face. I hit tab to see the surface behind it. And this is known at fault surface at A. So when it took my original surface and chopped it up, one of those surfaces become fault surface, and the other one becomes fault surface at A. I don't have any over any control over which it was, which one of those becomes fault surface, and which one one of them becomes fault surface at A, which is frustrating because um, it means I can't. If Qubit in another version decides to flip those two, I'm stuck uh, with the ambiguity and I have to update my Qubit script. Um, so that's how I got. These creating the fault surface, add node and fault surface, add node and fault surface at A. So I've created a group. Then I'm going to from that, I create a node set from that group. And so up here under node sets, and I'm going to turn off my mesh. So now you can see a little better that I have all the nodes associated with the fault surface. They're shown by the orange dots. And I'm going to do the same thing. Um, uh, so we're experimenting a little bit with uh, side sets. Um, we have not implemented using side sets within Pilot, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip over that. But that would create a side set. So now I'm going to do the boundaries, and I'm just going to highlight all of these and run through. So in some of these, I so here's my right x positive, I have x negative, y positive, that's the back side there, and front side, and here's the bottom. Now here's where it comes in handy to have groups because I'm going to add the nodes in face C negative, and then because I can't overlap Dirichlet boundary conditions with my fault boundary condition, I'm going to take my group, which was originally face C negative, and remove the nodes that are in the fault group. And so I will play that one. And so here's all of the nodes. My face Z negative is all of the nodes on the bottom. And then I also have a group that has all the nodes on the bottom minus the nodes along the fault surface. So that you can do you can do Boolean operations on groups. You cannot do Boolean operations on node sets. That's why we pretty much always um, create groups and then create node sets from those groups. And, and I have created a node set for the Z positive, and then to export my mesh. Um, that's the command I write. 
So we're going to export to tell me how many elements there were, how many nodes, how many node sets, how many boundary conditions. Um, so why did this? Uh, I must have, there must be some sort of, I'm not sure why it's saying boundary condition sets. I don't remember. There's probably none actually there because I do have two blocks and I have my faults. One, two, three, four, five, six boundary surfaces plus the one boundary surface without the fault. And um, so that's what gets exported. Are there any quick questions related to um, this simple example? When generating the mesh. I know I went through that quickly and you weren't able to follow along um, at the same rate I was. Um, and that's one reason why we record these um, so that you can uh, come back and play them back at your speed and stop them and pause them um, so that uh, you can then follow along um, step by step with what we do here in the tutorial. So the question is, how did I know which type of mesh to choose? And um, in this case, uh, I had a nice square box. I had nice flat interfaces. Um, and so a hex mesh was, I'm in 3D, so a hex mesh was the most obvious. Um, very simple, um, didn't have to, I have perfect mesh quality. Everything is uh, a uniform. Uh, Size. I had in this case, I don't have no constraints on one, trying to have a higher resolution, say near the fault than farther away. A lot of times, um, uh, we do want sort of finer resolution near the mesh, I mean, near the fault or near the ground surface, and so we'll vary the discretization size. Um, uh, some of our previous tutorials, we cover a 2D subduction zone example. And you can see how we vary the mesh in 2D on a triangular surface um, for that one. Uh, there's a question about topography and the UV net surface. And I'll refer you to um, our previous tutorials. Um, they have uh, sessions that cover the UV net surface and meshing in uh, 2D and 3D. And you can see, that, uh, I believe those meshing examples are not discussed in detail at all in the, um, in the pilot manual. Um, and um, that is because that's really using Qubit. Um, and we do do the sort of hands-on tutorials and have those recorded sessions. Uh, there is Qubit. Supply, and Trellis supply their own extensive tutorials, so you can get an idea. And they have their own support mailing list, um, so you can get very specific answers to questions related to sort of details that we don't know the answers to in terms of the mesh meshing engine and, that, and other types um, of issues. Generally, you're probably if you're just starting out, it's fine uh, to answer send those questions to CIG Short um, because. Uh, we are one of the few groups that actually uses qubit for geophysical type problems. Usually the problems for qubit and trellis are much more engineering oriented. So they're used to things like spheres, blocks. They're not used to things like fault surfaces and topography. So uh, we have about half an hour, 45 minutes left. Um, we may need to run a little long. Um, so I'm going to stop here with qubit. So I'll minimize that window, close my journal file, and I'm going to